in answer to uh, Monica's question, I spent so much time in the last couple weeks thinking about four and five hundred years ago that I wasn't really collecting a lot of current statistics, but as anyone would guess who's familiar with the struggles of oppressed nations and people of color and poor and working people in this country, on the reservations, it's the most extreme situations that are found of isolation and poverty and all of the normal, you know, not normal, but typical ills of poverty that we've all seen and experienced ourselves. The highest levels of suicides of the youth known in the country and a great lack of access to what we consider as the most basic resources like being overcharged way beyond what we pay for a gallon of gas or a cigarette or whatever, let alone, you know, opportunities for education. There are urban communities in this country. There's a, there's a, an indigenous urban community in New York. There are large communities on the West Coast, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Still, you know, because of the legacy of Columbus and the conquista doors and the other inv invasions that the population was so decimated that we're still in this country such a tiny percentage of, of the whole. So that in the urban communities and a lot of the people there were terminated under U.S. law. They were like, oh, move to the cities and you'll have all these opportunities in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. They moved there, they were terminated and there weren't any real opportunities and, and they had to you know struggle for the worst of the jobs. So they're as effective as all of the other oppressed communities and yet the blinders are on with mainstream society no one's supposed to see the indigenous they don't exist anymore we'll just ignore them right the poorest county in the US is Pine Ridge uh, reservation in South Dakota and um, as most of us know that um, just like with the black and Latin communities, there's huge numbers totally out of proportion to uh, the numbers of the population of uh, youth in prison, men in prison, also numbers of young men and women who enlist in the military and die, and uh, women and children suffer and people do struggle to keep the matrilineal traditions where they are remembered in some communities alive in spite of overwhelming indoctrination of the bourgeois values that negate the value of all of our lives as poor working people and as women, men, and children, and, and working people and people of color. And um, I'd like to thank Heather for dinner. It was great. And just to let you know, chocolate actually is healthy, but not when you make it in cake with sugar and probably <laughs> leave the milk out. And uh, yeah, it's true. Buffalo were killed to conquer the Plains Nations and because they, they knew that, that that was, you know, like the main supply line for all the Plains Nations. And um, we hear recently that the battle against, I think it's the Keystone Pipeline that's been going on for a few years has the potential now to be won and stopped due to the opposition of the First Nations in Canada who oppose it crossing their land. So we need to keep our eye on that struggle. Thank you to Marielena for your comment on the contamination of the corn and the effect on Mexico. And it relates to all of the health crises in this country today. And really what they're doing is, is an another genocidal war crime against Mexico and against all of us because the food purity of our crops is a precious resource for the peoples of the world. And, um, and I want to thank Deirdre for your comment and just to mention I think Greenland has had home rule now for a few years and there's some differences apparently that it was a little bit less of a settler state than the others but I don't know enough about it to comment more than that. Um, one of my professors at San Francisco State, uh, Betty Parent, who was one of the first professors in the ethnic studies in, in American Indian Studies Department there, she went on a trip to the Soviet Union with other Alaskan, Athabascan language speaking people to visit Soviet Siberia when it was still Soviet and met their like distant cousins, Athabathan, Athabascan language speaking people there who had under the Soviet Union uh, all the learning materials and books and colleges in their own languages which we never had here. And since the, st the struggle for ethnic studies began in this country in the 60s, um, and it continues today as we see going on, you know, with the horrible things happening in Arizona, that we do have more authors in print representing all of the oppressed communities, including indigenous authors, than ever before in this country. And we also do know more 
today uh, than we did even 30 years ago about what happened. Thanks also to many progressive scientists and social scientists who were contemporaries of or following in the footsteps of Carl Sagan and Howard Zinn who have brought us a lot of new information and resulting new analyses to public view. For instance, like this textbook in archaeology that was held up for years as this standard called Nomads of the Longbow by Alan Holmberg. And he went to Bolivia. I guess he meant well, but he didn't really know anything. And he visited this Cironio people in Bolivia. And, and he thought, they're living in poverty in the woods. They, they're Paleolithic holdouts. But in reality, they had survived a 95% die-off due to smallpox and then fled uh, in forced slavery to white cattle ranchers in Bolivia. And that's why they were impoverished in the forest. They preferred that to living in slavery on the ranches. On the gold prices that I gave, they were based on a very out-of-date figure at 400 an ounce. I looked on my iPhone while people were uh, commenting, and I think the price now is something like 1750 an ounce. So that would be like 43 times as much. So Atahualpa's ransom to Pizarro instead of 65 million is something more like $2,800 million. Something like that. We could look it up. But uh, about all of this new information that we have today, we are dialectical materialists. We welcome all this new information. We make our own analyses as well, and we're going to take it further, of course. And once again, I'd like to urge everyone to think about going to Day of Mourning this year. Get on the bus. You'll be really happy that you went. And to learn more about the true history of what happened at Plymouth, look at the website of United American Indians of New England. It's www.uaine.org. And read Moon Anum James talks that are posted and some of the other talks that are there. Thank you.